Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so my name is Jeff Sorensen. I'm the Director for Social Innovation for the U of M College of LSA, and also the co-founder and director of Optimize, which is a student-led program here at the university that creates a community and an incubator for students to start their own self-directed projects that aim to make the world more just and more sustainable. And uh, sort of just in my personal life, I'm also a huge fan of Nathan J. Robinson and current affairs. Um, I assume some of you are here because you are as well. <laughs> and so I've been thinking for a while about how do I sort of merge my love for what Nathan does with th the work that I also love that we do here. And uh, at some point we were just talking uh, and kind of figured out, you know, there's a lot of students who would benefit greatly from understanding how do you get traction in the media, whether that means pitching stories to journalists and existing outlets, or whether that means doing what Nathan's did and starting your own media venture to get the ideas that you believe need to be in the world out to the world in a way that people actually pay attention. Um, Nathan's been pretty good at this. Uh, since starting on a Kickstarter a few years ago, uh, he's grown current affairs uh, to have subscribers in all 50 US states, 25 countries, um, while turning out a seemingly endless amount of content uh, from a, a, a relatively small group of people. Um, they've grown from, in their first year, having $10,000 in revenue to this year being set to have $300,000 in revenue. And uh, just, I think, really doing a great job at starting to influence discourse at a higher level than, than you know, most people might imagine that you could if you're just starting, getting started with this. So I know a lot of you are interested in, in media ventures. Um, or just learning how to kind of interact with the media generally. And uh, Nathan's going to you know, tell us a little bit about his own story of how, over the past few years, he's, he's started to kind of get into this space and started to find some success. So uh, really glad to have you here. He's a, a, a very talented writer, good friend, uh, Nathan J. Robinson. Okay, thank you very kindly, Jeff, for that really, really very generous uh, introduction. Uh, water. Yes. Water is there. Oh, the water is there. Oh, um, I will make every effort not to accidentally kick it over. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, stand on this side. Um, hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Thank you. We have people who came all the way from Toledo to be here, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I... I um, I thought that I'd give you a talk on, I've titled this talk, How to Spread Your Ideas If You Find That You Must. And I, as Jeff said, run a small, if you're not familiar, I run a small magazine called Current Affairs. This is Current Affairs. We are based in New Orleans, Louisiana. We have been going since 2015. Um, I thought uh, that the way that I would sort of structure this is first to just give you a little bit of background, as Jeff said, on what we have managed to do, uh, because we've sort of built something from scratch that I think can offer you maybe some lessons if you're, uh, if you're interested. Um, and then I thought I'd give sort of a guide to what I've learned over the last couple of years about writing, publishing, and the media, because I think I have some useful lessons for, for anyone who wants to um, publish ideas and wants to build institutions. And then I thought, finally, we could just go through the op-ed structure, the structure of the typical newspaper op-ed, which is a really useful way of getting an idea that you have a thing that is not being discussed enough, uh, taking it and, and bringing it to a wider audience. So I thought well, uh, that at that point, I could you know, turn to some of you and we could, we could ask about the ideas that you have, the projects that you have, and think about how we might use newspaper op-eds, um, how we might structure something uh, that would get attention, how we might um, uh, get things published. Uh, because I want to be really practical. I want you to leave here uh, with advice that you can uh, use. Um, and so in, this, in the second part, this, this substance, the substance of what I want to give you uh, tonight uh, is a little bit about actually writing stuff, how to uh, write clearly, write in ways that persuade your audience, that get people who might not necessarily be naturally interested in your ideas or might not agree with your ideas, how to get those people uh, to pay attention to you. 
and then how to actually publish the, the sort of the, the, the procedural aspect of writing, which is not just how do I write well, but then how do I actually get this piece of writing that I've done um, into a media outlet, um, the, into an existing media outlet. Uh, the second part of that is if you are interested, I'm just going to have this is going to be a brief part. I'm going to talk about the career of writing, and we're going to talk about you know, the, the conventional wisdom that you can't, you can't possibly feed yourself as a writer, which is sort of true, but also there are ways uh, to make more, to do, uh, to have more and less of a shot of actually managing to sustain yourself as much as possible uh, with your writing. And then third, you know, my perspective on this is that I'm very, I'm a little bit cynical about existing media, um, and I, after some time as a, as a freelance writer, writing for lots of different publications, you know, I kind of decided that I, I really did, I didn't like a lot of the constraints that they put on your on your writing, and I, I thought I could do uh, a better job, uh, if, or I, I thought I could, it would be more satisfying. I could produce writing that I was prouder of if I actually started my own um, independent uh, magazine. And I don't I don't have any money, so that was that's that was difficult because I'm not you know you don't uh, starting a magazine is, is you know considered quite expensive, and also everyone says that print is dead, uh, so that's an obstacle um, if you're in a dying medium uh, that has apparently no. Future future. Um, so the question is then how do we get over these huge obstacles? Everyone talks about the fact that um, you know the big, even the big well-funded media outlets are not are all struggling. They all don't know what to do. Uh, so how in this very, very difficult climate for media do you build a media organization? So, uh, but first, let me just tell you a little bit more. I mean, Jeff g gave a really, a really nice introduction uh, to our magazine, but I just want to tell you uh, a little bit more. As he said, what we did um, is in 2015, I was, <laughs> I was in a, 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 I was looking through the newsstand, um, and I was in, I was in Boston uh, at a, at a newsstand, and I was picking up, I picked up a copy of Time magazine, and I was sitting flicking through a copy of Time magazine, and I thought. This isn't very good. I thought, I, thought, I wonder if I could, I, could, I could probably make Time Magazine on my laptop if I wanted to. Because if you look, there are a lot of design tricks that, I mean, I don't know if any of you have done graphic design, but uh, graphic design is a lot of, a lot of little, little tricks that once you learn them, it's really easy to make something that looks really, really good. Um, and I thought, well, you know, it might actually be possible to pretty easily uh, make a print magazine. I, in, you know, in the early 90s, you would have had to have a million dollars to start a print magazine because there was no way to tell anyone about it. How do you get people, how do you find subscribers? I mean, before the internet, you have to, you have to mail out, you have to get into newsstands, you have to, there's a huge upfront capital investment. But now, um, print costs have gone down, the cost of putting a website up is, is, is nothing, is negligible. Um, so I thought, well, that, that's, that's interesting, maybe we could... Uh, maybe we could build something with not, not many resources. So we did a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, that was, it raised I mean, more money than I thought we'd raise, but it raised $16,000, which you know, is not actually much for starting this kind of business, but it was enough to get us, to get us started. Um, and from there, we published, uh, we just started, uh, we put out our first print issue to a, a couple of hundred subscribers. And they seem to enjoy it. We started churning out articles on the website, um, and then we, in February of 2016, we really got we got our first million page view article, and it was an article called. Um, uh, it was, it, this was back at the time when nobody thought that, that Donald Trump had a chance of being president. And it was an article called, uh, Unless the Democrats Run Bernie Sanders, a Trump nomination means a Trump presidency. And we were pointing out some of the ways in which uh, Trump's strengths as a candidate against Hillary Clinton were sort of being underestimated. And that got us a ton of attention. Uh, you know, I, I went on Democracy Now! to talk about it. That got us more subscribers, and our subscriber count started going up and up and up. And then, 
as th when the election happened in November of 2016, uh, the, you know, then our subscriptions really took off because then people said, well, I think current affairs' political analysis from the election was more on point than a lot of the major outlets. And so, you know, if you look at our, if you look at a chart of our subscriptions, they're going like this, 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 and then November, you know, November 8th, 2016, they start going whoosh, like that. And um, so, we, and, over, and then I have finally managed, I was in, grad school at the time and then I finally managed to as the subscription took off I took a year off school and it managed to pay me full time to do this writing to run this magazine we were able to open an actual office for the magazine now again this is starting with $16,000 um, you know from this crowdfunding campaign now we have a small office uh, for the last year and a half in New Orleans we have had um, uh, a one-room office and just this month we have expanded to be a two-room office and soon we will hopefully become a three-room office and we have you know, for a long time I was the, far, the only full-time staff member then we took on another part-time staff member now we've taken on another full-time staff member and so uh, we are sort of uh, growing and we started putting out um, uh, we, 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 we branched into podcasting this year and our podcast is doing really well um, and it has you know, it's, Ten to about fifteen thousand subscribers, I think. Um, you know, and then the first year of the podcast, that's pretty good. And um, the, and so we've we managed to you know build this other other arm of the thing, and we've started putting out books. This is a collection of my uh, essays from current affairs called Interesting Times. Uh, this one is called The Current Affairs Rules for Life, um, and this one is one on the uh, the President of the United States called Trump Anatomy of a Monstrosity, and. Um, so, you know, we're, we're managing, and we're starting to do more video stuff, so, you know, we've, we've kind of built, uh, just to give you a sense of, of you know, to the, to the extent that I have anything useful to say, this is what, you know, this is what we managed to do if, you, if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Now, so then I want to go into uh, the, actual, the actual meat of what I can give you, which is sort of advice on writing and, and, and publishing. But before, just before I do that, I just want to give you, because I was thinking, I, I've got this, I've got this you know, the title for the talk is How to Spread Your Ideas. And then I was thinking, well, that's, that's this weird kind of morally neutral thing, because it could be like, well, what if, your idea, what, if you, what if you have evil ideas? You could use the things that I'm going to sell you for, for, for good or for bad. Um, and I wanted to think about, because as I think of like telling people how to spread their ideas, I think it's also really, really important um, to be self-critical. And I spend a lot more time, I try and, sp or try, uh, and spend a lot more time um, thinking, developing the ideas than uh, actually spreading the ideas. And what I mean is, so, so you know, a tool, how to, how to spread your ideas, how to build a media organization, it's a morally neutral thing, right? In that, like, you could use it, as I say, for good or for evil. Um, but the world has a lot of, of, of very serious problems in it. You have to take a uh, serious stance. So I don't want to give you, so I, I, I feel very strongly that it's important to say that before you start thinking, how do I influence the world, you have to think, uh, is my influence on the world a, a good influence? Because it's very easy to say, uh, you know, I, I don't want this to be a marketing presentation. How to market your, yourself and your ideas no matter what. You gotta think, you know, um, is, is, what we, is what we do here valuable? And I also think there's a number, there's, there's, in giving a talk like this, there's something that I really want to avoid, which is the impression that you should spend your time, most of your time thinking about, you know, how do we get publicity for this thing? How do we get attention for this thing? And I will tell you that to the extent that we have succeeded at current affairs in managing to build an audience, managing to build a media outlet, I think one of the reasons is that we have spent very little time actually on marketing, very little time on promotion. Uh, what I when I get up every day and, and go to think about what we're going to do at the magazine that day, what I really think about is how do we put out 
really, really good material. And I think this is, this is the responsibility you have is to think, you know, how do I, how do I put out the, the, the best thing? And then, and then really the attention often comes later. Um, so there is a degree to which uh, you have underappreciated issues. And we're going to talk about things tonight where uh, there's something that you're aware of that other people aren't aware of, that you want to make people aware of. Um, but at the same time, I also think that it's so, so important in, especially in building an organization, to focus mostly on the, the, the kind of product or, or the, the thing that you're making. For, you know, spend your time cultivating your craft. The best way to succeed, I think, as a writer is to just become the best possible writer that you can. Uh, just, just, just become really, really, really good at it uh, rather than thinking. Uh, and so I always emphasize like that over things like you know, networking. You know, focus on really developing your ideas so that they're good and so that they make the world better and so that they are valuable and that you're, you know, when you are going out and, and promoting and building organizations around it, uh, you, you're doing something worthwhile. So it's a prefatory note. Um, okay, so I wanted to start with writing. I want to start with, because I, I've kind of, um, you know, I, I, I've built an audience for the writing that we do at, at Current Affairs, and I, I want to just give you the things that that I've learned over the last three years that I think are really good writing tips that um, if you have ideas that you want to spread and you want to write them down and you want people to read it, this is, this is the best thing, these are the best things that I've come up with that I, that I know. And the number one thing is, uh, num number one thing, and I, I don't even know if I got this writing advice in school, but I don't know why they don't give it, is every word that you write, be thinking about the person who's reading it. Um, and be thinking, what is this person thinking at this point of reading my writing? Is this person bored? Is this person confused? Um, I mean, is this person, you know, to, is this person following me? Are they enjoying themselves? Is there a point at which they, their attention sort of drifted away? Everything I write, and, and the feedback that I've gotten from our readers is that they really like current affairs pieces because they feel listened to by our writing. Now, that's a little weird when you think about it because you can't actually listen to your reader. Your reader is a sort of, uh, you know, mysterious box. You don't know who's going to be reading your thing. You're imagining a person. So how do you listen to it when it's actually just a one-way monologue? Um, but one of the things you can do is, I mean, I try and anticipate all of the questions that my readers will have and answer those questions. And we are sort of an unapologetically left-wing political magazine. We're pretty, we, you know, we're on the sort of left side of the Democratic Party. But one of the things that we do uh, is we try and write for a non-left audience, which is that when I write a piece, I try and think about the unpersuaded reader, the person who isn't buying it, the person who everything I say, they're going, no, that sounds like crap. That's just, I don't believe you. I don't believe what you're saying. Persuade me. And I like to assume that, that kind of reader in my head. And I think if you do that, if you write for the person who disagrees with you the most, uh, then you, when you've written that, you will have something really, really compelling because it will be able to persuade people, even people who were very unsympathetic to you at the beginning. Now, the second thing I'd say is that... <sighs> There's this, there's this common sense that we live in an age of very short attention spans. And it's kind of true, but it's kind of not. Um, there's this sense that you have to do, you have to produce really, really short things. And if you do a video, it has to be a two minute video. If you do a piece of writing, um, you know, the, the, when the, they had a, a new editor at the New Republic who took over, um, who was very sort of, uh, he came out of Silicon Valley and his perspective was, any writing over 500 words is boring, no one's gonna read it. And I don't think that's true. The, one of the most popular pieces on our website that got, the, one of the few pieces that's got like in the million view counts uh, was an 11,000 word deconstruction of Brett Kavanaugh's Senate testimony. Now that sounds incredibly, t you wouldn't think that was a real crowd pleaser, right? 11,000 words, <laughs> so many words. Um, but that was one of the most popular articles we've done. Um, so I distinguish between clarity and organization and brevity. 
You know, people think that if it's brief, it's punchy. But it, brief and punchy, then that's, that's persuasive, that's clear. But you can be clear and well-organized without necessarily being short. And, you know, there is no such thing as too long. There is just too boring, right? As long as you're holding people's attention, you know, you can keep going. So the question is, am I, am I holding people's attention? I think it's really important. It's especially important if you're doing that thing number one, which is trying to persuade unpersuaded people. Because they're going to have a lot of questions. And you're going to need time in your writing to answer those questions. Um, it's, if, if you don't answer the unanswered questions, then people go away and they're not persuaded. But what I do is I write 10,000 word things. So by the end, every possible thing you've thought of has been responded to in the, in the article. Um, the, the next thing, the real thing, is uh, the, the best tip that I can give anyone going in to writing who looks at their drafts and hates their writing. I meet so many people who are like, I, I write, I, I hate the things that I write. I, I produce it and I just cringe at it when I look at it. It's so bad, it's so awkward. Um, and, the, and the thing that I always say is, you know, uh, I really think that underestimates what people who are successful writers are doing, which is that they're revising. I hate every first draft I write. Every time I write something and I look at it, I have that feeling, I hate this, I hate it. Um, but the fortunate thing is you don't have to show anyone to, it to anyone until you're happy with it. So revise, revise, revise. You do 20 revisions, you go through and you scrutinize every word and you say, is that word what's making it awkward? Let me try 50 different words. And then you sort of, you sort of build slowly through the revision process, you build something that you're finally satisfied with. That's the process of writing. Uh, very few people can write a really good first draft. Uh, they say it's a cliche that writing is revision, but I didn't really realized this until I started writing for a living that, it, that it's so, so important because you can, if you revise, take the things that you hate about your writing and get, and get rid of them and it's a slow process. Um, number four, you should probably tell the truth. And what I mean by that is one of the things that I used to do in my writing when I first started as a political writer is I used to kind of, if there was a fact that undermined my argument or that made me kind of uncomfortable, I wouldn't mention that, right? Because I want to make the most persuasive argument. So if there's something that's true that kind of supports the other side's argument, I would kind of gloss over that. And now I don't do that because I think your audience is smart and your audience responds better when you say, when you confront the truth head on. So I don't think you should be a lawyer. Right, so you know, if you're if you're a lawyer, if you're sort of um, a person who's just trying to construct the case that sounds the best, you can succeed. But what it means is, if you gloss over inconvenient or uncomfortable facts, uh, it means that someone who's responding to you can then bring up the inconvenient and uncomfortable facts, and they can go, "Look at all the stuff you overlooked. Look at all the stuff you buried. Look how dishonest this person is being with you. They're not presenting." So what I do is, I'm the first to present the uh, opposing case, uh, opposing case, and I present it even better than the other side will present it. Um, and I think that's really useful. I think confronting the truth head on. Don't be afraid of things that make your argument, um, uh, that, seem, that seem to go against your argument. Deal with them. Deal with the truth. Um, people say a lot that uh, as a write, when you're developing as a writer, you want to develop a voice as a writer. And I think that's a really hard thing to actually consciously try to do. I think you need to just develop the, what you think is the best writing and that, that the voice thing will come. And I, I, I worry about this piece of advice, but I will tell you that I have noticed it emerging in my own writing over time as I've done. I mean, I've probably written, probably written like at least 500,000 words in the last couple of years which is it's a lot of words. Um, and you know, over time as you write, these things kind of, you develop a style. And my style is, I found, I like digressions and asides. I like little parentheticals. I like little jokes. I like, you know, I like being, having a sense of warmth. I like self-deprecation. And I've developed a kind of individual voice over time. But I don't think you should focus so much on like, who am I as a writer? Just focus on like, what, what do I want to say? And how do I say the thing in the way that will make people really, really want to read it? And then, the final thing I'll say about the actual craft of writing is that 
you, some people need more confidence and some people need more humility. Um, a lot of people need more confidence because so many people think I'm terrible at everything. I'm, a bad, I'm bad at writing. I can't do this. Th those people I really want to give confidence to. And the first way that you can give people confidence is by um, giving them examples of... So, we live in a world where being really good at something doesn't necessarily correlate with success. Um, and what I mean is like, you know, I, if one of the ways that I reassure myself that I'm a good writer is that I open the New York Times op-ed page and I read David Brooks. Because I hate David Brooks' writing. I hate it. I think it's terrible. <laughs> and then I go, you know what? I'm a good writer. Because I am as good as some of the things. There are people, and look, we live in a world where Donald Trump is the president of the United States. You don't need to be good at things in order to succeed, is what I'm saying. Um, I think it's important. I think it's really important, actually, though, because a lot of people, and you probably have, uh, or, you know, a lot of you have probably had what they call imposter syndrome, which is, you know, when you get, when you succeed, and then you think, I'm not good enough. Everyone else is better than me. And, you know, I had that a lot. Uh, I really, really did, and and I thought I'm I'm never I'm not going to be as good at this as some other people, and that really it's funny it disappeared for me uh, in November of 2016 because that was when I thought oh it, it, you don't actually forget forget trying to be uh, it's not that you're not good enough anyone is good enough you should really be and I worry because I meet so many people who are really really talented and not confident enough in themselves, and I think it's and, and actually I will point out a really important thing is the gender thing here because um, one of the f fascinating observations as a magazine editor is we get pitches from the public. People, writers, write in. They want to submit to our magazine. And they will write in. They don't know us, and they'll have a piece, and they want to show us the piece, and they want us to, want us to publish it. 90% of the blind submissions that we get are from men. And there is a huge... And I noticed that when... So my, my, my kind of... Uh, this, is, this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but like, I would say that when men email me their pitches, I get, um, could you please let me know when you're going to get back to me on this? <laughs> and when women email me their pitches, they go, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you with this. And there's a huge... It's a, it's, a, it's a generalization and it's a stereotype, but there's, a, there's often a huge confidence gap and they're really, they're, that is very, very real. Um, where, you know, it is uh, where I notice that female writers for current affairs feel less confident even in their writing, even when they're way better. And so I, 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 think, I think confidence is a... And on the other hand, <laughs> the flip side is some people need hum more humility, right? Because you get pieces of writing where people, are, people think it's amazing and, you, and, and then you go, why did you think anyone would want to read this? And you, you, really, do, you really do get p pieces like that and it's important. That's why I say, you know, people who are not doing number one, who are not thinking, who are not imagining their readers, who are just thinking, what do I want to say rather than how is someone taking this? How is the reader interpreting this? Um, humility makes for better writing. It really does. If you're self-critical, you scrutinize your writing, um, but don't but don't lose the, the hope that you can that you can be really good at conveying information because I, I think I think many people many many people can do it and people can who could people can do it who don't think they can. So. Um, we can talk more in the Q&A on, on, on how to write uh, in ways that are effective. I want to talk about the industry, though, because when you, when you try and actually take a piece of writing that you've written at home and then you want people to actually read it, you are, we are all situated in a world where there are media institutions, and those institutions are the gatekeepers of information. Those institutions are what determines what gets in front of people's eyes and what doesn't. And so if you want to then publish your writing to get it to the maximum possible audience, you have to not just write well, but you have to get a, a, people to accept it. And I will give you a few really, really useful tips, what I think are really useful tips here. And the first is, and this is kind of on the confidence thing, is one of the really exciting things is that th in the 24-hour news cycle, um, every media institution is looking for content all the time, every day. Every day the newspaper has to publish an edition and they need to fill space, they need to fill column inches. Every day a website wants to put out entries. Every day, you know, the cable news networks need to have people talking about things that matter. 
And that means there's a whole, there are thousands of people out there, editors, who are dedicated to finding stuff. And they're looking for stuff all the time. So you shouldn't hesitate to email an editor and, and, and say, I have a thing. I think you should publish the thing. Because editors love receiving submissions because it makes our job way easier when we don't have to actually go out and find the writing. It just comes to us. It's fantastic. You might think that by emailing someone you don't know who works for a publication um, and saying, hi, I've written a thing, you might think that's an act of kind of arrogance. Th th we're grateful. I, the more things I get in my inbox that I get to choose among uh, as to what to publish, it's fantastic. Um, and so don't be afraid to bother editors. The, the, and, and here's another thing that's really important. When you think about um, how to publish your writing, think about what institutions exist. You know, is this a magazine I like? There's a magazine I like. I want to. I, I think read read their content. Look at how it looks. What sorts of things do they publish? Can I imagine the thing that I've written fitting comfortably next to? Can I see it on the page? Can I envisage this as the kind of thing they would want? And if not, let me let me rework it into the kind of thing that I think would fit really well. And then what you do is you uh, have to get it in front of an editor's eyes. Um, and that's easier than you might think. Um, some places have submissions processes that, that they've, or, you know, they have like a guide to submitting. Uh, a lot of places don't. Um, I always recommend ignoring their process because I know that uh, a lot of places don't even look at their submissions inboxes. Um, they, some places do, and I think you should use it, but the, the, the easier way is, one, one of the things is, if you get the emails of editors, one of the best ways to get published in places is to find editors. Get to know who's editing the magazine, right? The magazines are edited by people. Those people have email addresses. Um, it's often really easy to find those email addresses because they're usually first name, dot last name at, the, at the, the publication com. I'm Nathan at Current Affairs. If you email what I used to do when I was trying to do freelance writing is I would BCC every possible variation of that person's email address and then I hoped that I would get through to that editor and usually you would. And, um, and, and, it, and it's really easy. But there's also, you know, if you find one email address from a magazine, you can find how, how the, the convention does it. And when you do, you send them a pitch email. And in the pitch email, you say, you know, I have a pitch for you. I have a topic. You describe the topic. You describe why you're qualified to write on the topic. Um, make it short. Make it snappy. Give them some writing samples. Uh, if you want to attach the full article that you've written, you can. It's often better not to. It's often better than to give them just a little taste. Um, they're not going to look at your email for more than 15 seconds until they um, you know, get bored and move on. So you really got to catch their attention very quickly. But if you do, I mean, this is what I did. I, I, got, I got published in a lot of different places because I just emailed editors over and over and over and over. Most of the time, they didn't respond. Um, when they did respond, most of the time, they said, sorry, we're not interested. But you, you could, it doesn't matter if you get 100 rejections, because if you get one acceptance, nobody will ever see your rejections. Nobody will ever see that. Nobody in the public will ever know how many things you got rejected. They only know, uh, and you know, we, we, know, we know that some of the best-selling books are always rejected by tons of publishers. So you know, have confidence. Don't, don't get discouraged. Um, I, I do think, you know, yeah, it, it does help if you know people who write at places, and you can go, hey, I've got a thing. Um, but I still think focus on writing something that is so persuasive, so compelling out of the gate that when, when an editor sees it, they go, I've got to put that in our publication. That's perfect for our publication. And, um, and, and I'm going to give you an example uh, a little later of what, of what, of what I, one of the things that I did that kind of worked. Um, and uh, so yeah, I, I think I, it is easier, and I could give you more specific advice on how to find editors' emails and how to, uh, how to deal with the, uh, this process. Um, then I just want to say a couple of words about writing as a career. Because one of the things is, um, it's all very well to uh, write, to want to spread your ideas and want to get published, and you can do that. But we live in a world where uh, you know, we all need material resources to live. Some of us don't have any money, and we need to survive. And you know, if you want to, you, you, can't, you can't live on ideas. 
Um, now, so I think, it, so it is infamously difficult to write for a living. To every, nearly every writer I know uh, does not, has some other gig that they do. They're in academia or they are, you know, they, they do, they just do a day job completely unrelated. Most of our current affairs editors are, are lawyers by day and write by night. Uh, you know, I, I'm very fortunate uh, to be someone who, get, who gets to write from a, you know, for, for a career. Um, I would say the first thing is though, don't, don't assume that it is impossible. I mean, if you are interested in doing, in writing for, don't assume that because that will make it actually be impossible. Remember, there are people who make, in this world, who make their living as writers. There are plenty of people who do that. Now, it's a very small fraction of the total people, number of people who would like to do that, but there are people who succeed. Some of them write things that I don't think are fantastic, and they manage to make a living at it. So, you know, again, it's a sort of have, have confidence thing. Um, when I started thinking, well, how do I really, I, I was in grad school and I hated grad school. I was really, really, really miserable. Because um, uh, I could never write an academic paper. Um, and what I thought was, well, if I wanna, if I wanna make the thing that I like to do, my, my career, how, how am I gonna do that? And so number three here is, uh, I, I just started, this is like my number one tip for anything if you want to do it well is just look at what other people do that succeeded at doing the thing and then just do whatever they did. And that's kind of what I did with Current Affairs. There's, there's a left-wing magazine, you may have read Jacobin, uh, that is based in Brooklyn and they came out five years before we did. And they built up, there's just one guy, uh, uh, Basco Sankara, who, who founded it uh, while he was at college, he was 21 years old, and he built up an audience over time, uh, pretty successfully, and then they have now, you know, 50,000 print subscribers, whatever, you know, they have nearly a million dollars a year in revenue, and I talked to him, so I just saw that he'd managed to build a magazine from scratch, so I got in touch with him, and I go, what'd you, what'd you do? How'd you do that? <laughs> Um, he, he was really kind, he gave me some advice. Um, and people will often, everyone loves giving advice because it makes them feel important. Um, so you should always ask people who are successful to give them advice because it doesn't sound like you're asking them for anything other than like, let me make you feel important. So uh, always ask for advice and then, and then when they give you advice, often be really useful because they'll just tell you uh, the stuff they did and then, and then uh, and you just do it. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. I just, I literally, I, 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 uh, we got the printer that did, the, the print shop that did Jacobin to print current affairs. We got the web designer that designed their website, designed our website. We copied everything. Um, so I don't know how he did it, but I know how I did it, which is just doing what he did. Um, and they have, uh, so, and then number, number four here is, you know, you have a kind of choice between pursuing conventional careers in media, where there are people who are editors and staff writers at publications, but those jobs are, uh, you know, very small in number, or uh, you can strike it out independently, and um, which is which is what we did. And I happen to think, I think that it's way easier almost now to be independent than to pursue a career at a, a major outlet and you, ha and you can do whatever you want, which is great. Um, crowdfunding has been, really been a massive boon. Um, you know, our, our podcast in a couple of months became completely sustainable uh, and managed to pay a, a, an almost full-time person to run it just through Patreon. And, um, uh, and Patreon's superb. Uh, Kickstarter, we started the magazine through Kickstarter. Uh, it's great. Um, and the cr crowdfunding really does help because then you get a monthly, people, people sign up and you get like $5 a month from people and then you get that indefinitely and you just keep you know, directly giving and they take a cut but it's, you can, things add up really, really fast. Like our subscriptions total about $5 a month um, which uh, is $60 a year, which is actually quite a lot over the course of a year. $5 a month doesn't sound like much. But then if you think $60 a year, well, if we get 10,000 subscribers, you know, that's $600,000 a year coming into current affairs. And 10,000 sounds like a lot of subscribers, 
but it's not actually that much in a world of you know eight billion people. Um, it, it, you could find ten thousand people who pay you five dollars a month, and then you've got a, and then you've already got a, a, an enterprise with multiple full time staff. You got six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, now we're not quite there yet, but I think I think we'll be there fairly soon because it's not an unreasonable target. You really can do a lot because these small these small numbers uh, they add up really really fast. Um, so then just a couple of uh, things um, <clears throat> that I'd say I, I, in addition about building organizations. Um, the first thing is kind of something I mentioned at the, at the beginning, um, but I want to reiterate because I think it's so, so important because I think there is this tendency to think about branding and think about uh, you know, how, how do we brand our thing, how do we get people to talk about our thing, how do we generate buzz around the thing, which is, I think, wonderful. You need that, but just focus on making the best damn thing you can. And you know, what we did with, the, uh, with our first print issue is I just thought, well, how do I make a print issue that would be so wonderful that even though print is dead and everyone and nobody nobody wants print anymore they will want this because it looks great it feels great all the articles are really fun they're really interesting it's funny we've got art you know everything's so good that you you have to have it and if you focus on that like going like how do i make this really really compelling uh, i i think i think that is the first and most important thing to do um, you know, so I, I focus on how do we put out writing that is <clears throat> better than, than most other political writing. Uh, one of the things th that the conventional media wisdom on, on political writing is in the 24-hour news cycle, you have to catch the news cycle. So what people will tell you is, um, I've had editors, I've literally had, uh, when I wrote, I, I, I used to write a little bit, I wrote a couple of things for the Washington Post. And I submitted an article to them and the editor came back and said to me, um, this is after she published a couple of my things, she goes, I think this article is 24 hours too late. We missed the news. It's over. And you think, well, that's bizarre because this is about an important social issue. It didn't go away. Everyone's still, it's still really important. But she said, ah, people aren't talking about that. They've moved on. And that's the way that if, if you're pitching major media outlets that exist, that's going to be a real serious consideration for you. They all want what they call news pegs, tying what you write to a thing that's in the news right now. But that thing is going away fast. So there are editors who would have accepted something in the morning and they'll reject it in the afternoon because they think it's too late. Uh, if, if you're trying to get published places, that'll be a major consideration. However, I don't think if you're building an independent organization, we don't pay any attention to that. Because one of the things is, with current affairs, we think, well, it, it, let's, let's forget the news cycle. Let's just try and create something that's so good on this topic that people will read it even if the news cycle is over. And I think you can do that. I think you really can. Uh, so, you know, when Brett Kavanaugh was in the news, our article came out way later than everyone else's hot takes. But it was more in-depth. It said more stuff. So it, people, people still read it. Um, Second thing, I have an informal motto that I say in my head, which is subscribers are royalty, which is kind of like the customer is always right, but I'm not saying subscribers are always right. I'm saying they're always special. And they're always people that we value. And I mean, they could be completely wrong. Some of them have, you know, we get letters to the editor that have uh, opinions that I strongly disagree with. But always we want to make the people who give us money feel loved. They are giving me money. They're giving it to me to give them my opinions to just spew my thoughts at them. I mean, that is such a generous thing for them to do. And I, I have to always feel grateful. So I try and convey in my writing a real strong sense of gratitude and understanding that they didn't have to spend their money on this and that money is really hard to make. Um, that like $5 a month doesn't sound like much, but like, you know, it could be like, $60 a year is hours of people's labor. People work for that $60. That's hours of people's time. And then there's the time they spend reading it. So you have to treasure the people who were kind enough to support you. So I, I always try to make them feel that. And that's one of the reasons that we are able to retain a lot of subscribers is because, our, first off, our magazines are always late. They're like very late because we are a small operation. It's really hard. Um, but what we do is we try and make people f But I found that nobody cares if your magazine is late if they feel as if you care about them. 
So when I send them a if I don't send them a letter and the magazine just doesn't show up, they feel ignored. But if I send them a letter going, I understand that it's late, but we we're trying to make it really good. Um, you know, we're really appreciative of you. Everyone understands. We've never had a complaint about the magazines being late because we make people feel good. Third thing I say is there is no shortage of demand for good writing. Yeah, we do live in a world where it's saturated with, um, there's so much writing out there. And there are a lot of people who are very good and it's very difficult to make it. However, it's also true that if you look at polling numbers on media, everyone hates the media. People really don't like. People flip through their feeds and they're like, boring, 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 blah, blah, blah. Um, they, they're, they're tired of stuff. They don't like what they're getting. And that means that there's an opportunity for you to present something different and better. Um, it, if you write well, if you have good ideas, there's so many bad ideas in the world that everyone's really appreciative when they get the good ideas. So, you know, there really is um, a, a demand out there. Um, I find that, I, I mean, I, I have found that people, found, well, you know, people subscribe to our magazine. Um, you know, we haven't had to do that much to make people feel as if we're really good because everything else is kind of meh. And um, that's why when I looked at Time Magazine, I was like, this, this isn't very good. And that's amazing because it means that we don't have to be that great to be, to be pretty competitive. <laughs> um, you can be because other magazines, look at you, you look through other magazines, they're full of ads. They're full of like the, half of the thing is ads. They're on cheap paper. Um, you know, you read the articles, you skip most of them and you think, well, if my magazine isn't full of ads, it isn't on cheap paper, and it doesn't give you that sensation, um, people will want it. And, and I find that that's true. So I say that the 21st century media moment is catastrophe and opportunity. Because it is, it is in many ways a catastrophe. Newsrooms all over the country are being slashed. Um, you know, journalists are being laid off. It's harder than ever to find a media and writing job. Um, but there's still the same number of people the, the, the consumers of news haven't disappeared. The newsrooms have been cut. But the people who used to read the newspaper are still there. They don't have an alternative, but they're still there. Um, you can still find, you know, there are still plenty of people who really want to be informed. They want to read good stuff. And they don't have it. So I, I think there's a real opportunity there um, and, and that you can build um, uh, useful stuff. So. Uh, yeah, so I've gone through basically just a few tips on uh, actually things I've learned about writing, a few things that I learned about how, how to publish, and a few things about, about, about building organizations. But now wh what I thought I, I'd do um, is just ask you, uh, we, could, we could talk about maybe some ideas that you have. You know, uh, at, you know, Optimize has sponsored a lot of, of really great projects for people who have things in the world that they see that they want to change and ideas for how to change them. Um, but I thought maybe some of you could tell me ideas that you have and we could think about, you know, just preliminarily some of the things that we would, we'd just think about the things we would think about if we were trying to package these in ways that would get them more attention. So I don't know, uh, what I want to ask is, does it, you know, I want to ask from people who have a, an issue that they care about that they are kind of more familiar with than other people, something that you work on that other people don't work on or you spend your time thinking about. Um, and, and, uh, and I want to I wanna do that with you. But first, you know, because that's a little bit um, kind of, uh, that's a little bit high pressure, I just want to show you an example of an issue that I did and a, a way that I wrote about it um, so, we can t so you get a better sense of the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. So I, um, yeah. Are you ultimately going to want people to have paper and pen or not? No. Okay. No, I think we could just talk about it. We're not going to have to write anything down. Um, so I, um, a few years ago, I stumbled across a website um, that was the website of a, of a, of a prisoner in, in, on death row in Texas. And his name was Robert Pruitt. And Robert Pruitt had written on his website, and I usually, you know, I, I, don't know how, I still don't know how I stumbled upon this thing. But he'd written down on his website his autobiography, this guy who was on death row. And he'd written, and it was really long. And I, I just started skimming through it. And then I got really, really engrossed. 
because this guy had a fascinating story. And this guy's story, Robert Pruitt's story, was that when he was five years old, he started, uh, you know, Robert Pruitt's father had been, had been a felon and had been in prison most of his life. And then his father got out of prison. And then, uh, you know, he, his parents were both uh, uh, drug addicts. They lived in a trailer park in Texas. Um, and when Robert Pruitt was five, he got high for the first time. You know, when he was, when he was nine, he was, he was, you know, burglarizing structures. He was really, you know, his life went downhill at a very, very young age. And by the time Robert Pruitt was 15 years old, he'd been in and out of juvenile detention a lot. And then when he was 15 years old, he got sentenced to 99 years in prison in Texas. And the, and the real twist of this was that he got sentenced to 99 years. He had been with his father, his father the felon, and his father had murdered a man while 15-year-old Robert was with him. And Texas has what's called the law of parties, which means that every party to a crime is liable for the whole. So um, Robert, who had the, the, the issue at court was whether Robert had been part of the crime. And there was witness testimony that Robert had helped hit the guy, um, that he had been sort of with his father and participating in it. Now it's disputed whether he, you know, he denied that he participated in the killing. But what it meant was there was no dispute that, that Robert's father had killed the man. The dispute was whether Robert had been part of that murder. So he was sentenced to 99 years. Then when, and this is 15 years old, and then when a few years later he was accused of killing a, uh, uh, a prison guard while he, was, while he was in prison, then he was sentenced to death row. And so when I read his autobiography, he was in his mid-30s, and he had never seen the outside world since he was 15, and he was never going to see the outside world. And I started reading his autobiography, and it was fascinating. And I ignored it for a while. I, I just read it, and it was really interesting, and I remembered it, and I, I was like, wow. This is extraordinary. And then a few years later, I remembered, while I was publishing Current Affairs, I remembered Robert's autobiography. I went back to it. I thought, that was an extraordinary thing I read. I wonder if it's still there. And it had gone from the internet. So I tracked, it, I tracked down someone who knew him. And I said, do you remember that autobiography? It was really incredible. Because one of the things is that he, uh, while he was in prison, he read a lot of books. And he became a fantastic writer. And he, his autobiography was a real deep reflection on his life and how he ended up this way. And he was thinking about nature versus nurture. And he was thinking about questions of to what degree am I responsible for what happened to me even though I was born to a father who you know ultimately committed the crime that got me in prison and so I was fascinated by this by this autobiography it's a really moving piece of work and then when, when I came back to it a few years later I found that Robert was scheduled to be executed in about a month was his scheduled execution date when I when I have rediscovered this autobiography and I uh, I, I, get, yeah, I, mess, I, I sent him a letter, and I got it back. Oh, I, I only found out from him. He said, I, I thank you for your interest in my autobiography, but I'm scheduled to be executed next month after, after several years. So I got, I got fascinated by his case, and then I thought, well, I need, to, I need to write about his case. So I wrote an essay called The Autobiography of Robert Pruitt um, that went through his autobiography. And I really wanted to, I realized it was so strange that nobody had paid any attention to this issue. Nobody had paid attention to this guy in Texas who had a case that was kind of a very interesting case from a legal perspective because the Supreme Court has said you can't sentence someone to death for a ch crime they committed when they were underage. But he wasn't sentenced to death for that case. He was sentenced to death for a crime that he committed while he was in prison, but he still hadn't, but he was still going to be executed having been in prison since he was underage. So it was a very weird kind of fell a little bit in the, in the loophole. Um, so then I started, uh, so I wrote this essay and it got a lot of attention and we even managed to get it to a, a, a Supreme Court justice. And, um, and then well, that was just in current affairs. And then it came down to the wire. We were trying to find ways to get attention to Robert Pruitt's case. And I thought, you know, current affairs is a small publication. We only have a few thousand subscribers. I can get some attention to this case through my little magazine. But what I really want to do is find ways to get this story that nobody's telling in front of a large audience. So I had this thing where I thought, you know what, I, 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 I will 
I'll go, I'll, I'll go for the, I'll aim for the, aim for the highest I possibly can. I said, I want to get this. I want to put Robert Pruitt's story on the New York Times op-ed page, is what I said to myself. I said, I think I, I, I said, it's really interesting. Maybe I could do it. I've never published with them ever before. It's really, it's infamously really, really difficult. Um, and uh, so I drafted, I spent ages crafting what I thought was the perfect, how do you tell this man's story in just a couple of paragraphs so that when an editor opens that email, they will say this belongs in our publication and I was doing this on the night before he was scheduled to be executed I was I was I was writing this pitch email frantically and I thought this man I have to get some attention to this man's story so crafted the email wrote a sort of 700 word op-ed op-eds have to be real short um, sent it found the email address of a, uh, a New York Times op-ed editor uh, looked at all the op-ed editors bios to see who I thought had a, might be most likely to have an interest in criminal justice. I sent it off. A couple hours later, got a reply from an editor who said, uh, we'll put this up. Uh, here are some edits. Uh, and I thought, my God. Um, you know, I've never, I've never tried to you know, pitch them before, never have since, probably never going to be published there again. Um, but I got, it in the, I got it on the op-ed page. This is it. And it came out the morning of his scheduled execution. Um, Robert Pruitt was, I mean, he was executed that night. There was no way to stop it going forward. They, he'd already exhausted all of his appeals. But it got the story, if, if, if this hadn't gone into the New York Times op-ed page, um, he would have just been, uh, no one would have ever nationally seen this story. He was scheduled for execution, and nobody was talking about this case of a guy who'd been in since he was a kid, you know, in prison for his father's crime. Um, and, and we managed to get a lot of people interested in, in the story through just getting it to this editor. And it took, you know, I, I, I had this weird sense that I thought they were going to accept it even though they, you know, they hardly accept anything because um, it was such an important story that hadn't been told. And I just, you know, this is, this is just um, the beginning of the thing. So I just want to give you a sense of what you do when you have a story like this that you want to tell. Um, I began, you know, very, very simply. What is, the, what, is the, what is the factual circumstance here? Robert Pruitt is scheduled to be executed by the state of Texas on Thursday. That's, that's a very simple, very simple sentence. There's nothing particularly difficult about writing that sentence. He has never had a chance to live outside a prison as an adult. That gets at really the heart of the issue of why I think this is a special case. And then, it's an op-ed. What's your opinion on it? Taking his life is a senseless wrong that shows how badly the justice system fails juveniles. And you can see that this opening paragraph is, is really very simple. It's not that difficult to write something like this, but what it requires is focusing in on what's the story I want to tell, um, how do I tell it in, you know, in the clearest possible way that everyone will want to read on. So then you do in the next paragraph, then you tell a little more detail. Once you've got them sort of to, to uh, you know, then he was 15 year olds when he, it's just a, re, it's a, it's just a repetition of the second uh, sentence here, which is he was 15 years old when he last saw the outside world after being arrested as accomplice to a murder committed by his own father. Um, now he'll be put to death. Um, this is sort of the second paragraph is just sort of an elongated version of the first and then you go into more detail more detail about his father's life Sam Pruitt various trailer parks um, Tell his life story again as simple as you possibly can because they've got you know They do have limited column space and you really want to get into every issue uh, So I just told the story of the crime um, and then I'll just skip to the end paragraph Which is that mr. Pruitt's story illustrates just how brutally the criminal justice system can mistreat minors uh, He's going to be put to death because he was failed first by uh, his father Then by the Texas court system which threw his life away by sentencing him to 99 years at the age of 15 um, and this should trouble our conscience. Um, I really, I really, I think this is not a matter of, of, of I don't think this is a particularly impressive piece of writing. I just think this is thinking about what does it take to take something that you care about and you know about that other people don't know about and how do you shape that into something that is clear and that other people are going to feel um, compelled by. 
So I thought, you know, let's, let's, let's get a couple of examples maybe of things that you've been trying to draw attention to or thinking about, things that you might like to write about, things you've worked, projects you're working on, and let's just, let's just talk about it. Um, so the, what, what do people have? What do people work on here? Yeah, please. Uh, so I'm in a writing intensive for, oh, there's a microphone. Uh, so I am starting a paper for one of my classes, and I want to explore America's role in the surging right-wing authoritarian governments that are happening in Brazil, in Europe, and so it's something that I don't want to think about, like just limiting it to just my professor who's going to sure. read it. I want to see if, like, I can get it published and explore this more. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 presumably through your research. Oh, you, you, why don't you keep that just for a little bit so we, yeah. can, we can talk back and forth a little bit. Um, so for your research, you've probably, you now have looked into, you say America's role. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what America's role is then in these authoritarian? I, I haven't done any research about it because the uh, tentative topics were due today, but okay. like, I'm, yeah. I, I'm thinking about like looking at, because it's a foreign policy class, like mm -hmm. looking at America's role in soft power and what the standard we have set by having a democracy or a democratic system that can elect someone like Trump yeah. and what that means for like Austria yeah. electing a right-wing authoritarian and Putin still being in power and Bolsonaro coming right. to power in Brazil. Well, what's cool about this is that you have an angle here that is something that I, I really think this is genuinely novel because I haven't seen much about uh, making the case for America's, that, that, that particular point you say about what, it, what does the precedent that we set mean for other countries. I think one of the things that you, you might want to think about as you do this is um, you are able to uh, gain, to interest people in your ideas. First, I think you have a fantastic point, a really important point. And then what you want to do now, now that you're going to dive into this, is you want to thoroughly, thoroughly research the thing. Because what, you, what you'll find is that, one thing I, I've learned is that people think that everything is on the internet, you can really find information easily. It isn't. So much information is just, uh, is not, uh, is not online, not easily accessible yet. Which, but what, what's good is that it's actually still pretty easily accessible to someone who's looking for it. And that means that looking in old newspaper archives means you can dig up things that nobody else has seen. You know, I, I, I wrote a book about uh, uh, Bill Clinton's presidency, and I found that there were a lot of points uh, about Bill Clinton's presidency. I wrote about his record on, on uh, it, it, it's about his record on criminal justice and welfare and, and, and that sort of thing. I wrote, we looked through all newspapers, and I found all sorts of stuff that never had, that hadn't been published in any recent articles, because they just read the old newspapers. So you know, you might want to look and see um, uh, about Look through the history of president, U.S. presidents meeting with, uh, you, you know, people, senior f figures in the United States meeting with these people. Look at what these, well, look at what everyone was doing in the 1990s. Find out what Bolsonaro was doing in the 1990s. Uh, find out, you know, uh, you know, just look back and you'll have find lots of information that you can use to make your case. And then when you go to get more attention to something, you'll have novel facts. You'll have things that people haven't, haven't discovered before. You won't just have a good argument, but you'll have um, really interesting material. And I think, I think for what you're doing, the key is have really, really interesting material. Because I think as, a, as an article, it sort of writes itself in that it's just a really interesting point that hasn't been made before. Um, but I, I would suggest that, you know, dive into the archives, really find stuff that people haven't found before. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, please, let's. Oh, right. My idea is to change the human experience. Okay. During the Cold War, I was trained that in the 1990s would become the decade of the brain. Mm -hmm. Because this America moved so quickly into technology, the box, we call it inside the box, it stayed stagnated and it stayed small. Uh -huh. Therefore, those ideas that were on outside of the box, like a balloon, the box didn't increase in size to incorporate the ideas that are outside the box that never went into the box. Mm -hmm. So my idea is to change the human experience 
and to convince people that we need to expand our box of thinking to include those ideas on the side of the box, because mm -hmm. that's where our real solutions will lie. Well, what I want to ask you uh, first is, well, so what do you think uh, are some ideas then that you'd say, uh, you, when you talk about expanding the box, what, what sorts of things do you mean? Uh, you know, what, what sorts of the constraints do you think there are, and what sorts of things would you, you know? I think what we would need in order to expand the box include the outer perimeter people who mm -hmm. are outside where the real solutions mm -hmm. lie. Is that we're going to need systems, mm -hmm. software, technology, mm -hmm. um, internet of, of things. Mm -hmm. We're going maybe even a, maybe even a movement, not like a movement like sure. a civil rights movement, but a movement of ideas. Yeah, those would be the tangibles. Would be the software. The, the algorithms need to be changed. Mm -hmm. The mathematical equations need to be changed. Sure. Even not only the answers to the questions, yeah. but even the questions need to be changed. And I think that's going to be as much of an effort almost as putting a man on the moon. <laughs> that's probably true. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult to change large-scale systems. You know, what I, what I would you know, strong, strongly encourage you to do is, is you know, to have, you know, first you need to say, you know, this, this, this point about, you know, the, the, the ways that we need to expand our thinking, the questions that we need to answer. And I think then what you want to do is you want to think from a, from, a, from a writing perspective, from a perspective, when you're trying to persuade people, you, you think, um, you know, let me give you an example of some of the questions that I think are not being asked. Let me give you an example of some of the ways that I think that our algorithms are failing us, that they could be made better. And I think to the extent that you can, uh, what, what I encourage you to do is what, think, um, how do I make people imagine the change that I seek being real. Because one of the real barriers to people changing things is that they can't conceive of what it would look like. You know, you, you say transformation to them and they agree that they want transformation, but they can't really feel it because they can't envisage it. So what I think you, what you might want to do is sort of help people imagine what that different world, what that different expanded way of thinking would be through giving them examples of things that are going wrong and thing, ways that things could be uh, done better. And I think if you, if you do that, if you focus on how do I get people to imagine this new world I want, you, really, you, really, you can really help people, uh, you can really help your readers. Um, Examples, things. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah. So I, I, you should say, people should say your names, I think, probably. Sorry. I kind uh, of keep track of who else has hands also for you. Oh, good, so good, good. Yeah. Sorry, what's your name? I'm Jimmy. Um, so hey, Jimmy. I'm Jewish, I feel like I should say. Uh, I feel like the Jewish community has a very uncomfortable relationship to race science, and I kind of yeah. want to talk about it. Tell me, tell me what you mean. So uh, not to go up on a whole tangent. But I was reading mm -hmm. Brett, Ste time. Brett Stevens recently, and he, oh, yeah. wrote, he wrote a piece called, uh, you know, there, there should be a fence on the border. Israel tried it. It works, it works great, right? Sure. And um, so uh, he writes about this. Th he, he talks about, like, you know, the, the people who are monitoring the border in, uh, of Lebanon and Israel in Israel. And there's this, like, bunker that he describes. And he says the, the people who work in the bunker are all women because Israel has determined that women have longer attention spans. And I was, I was like, and, and you see, I, like, mm. I've, I've, you know, I've paid attention to mm -hmm. a lot of things and, and grown up in Jewish spaces. And I have seen a lot of similar things or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's no like r archive that I can really go to to like pull up examples or like talk right. about it in any kind of like, you know, clean, thorough way. But it's something I've been thinking about a lot and, you know, something that is like keep coming back. So sure. I wanted to bring it up. Uh, well, you know, I think what, what, you, what you may want to think about here is you, you have, that's, that's a really good example of what you, you so the, the idea here is that you, you see People who sort of bad, would you say bad social science, or would you say like yeah, like like Steven Pinker talks about how like Ashkenazi Jews are like bred to be intellectuals or something, you know, like and I, yeah, yeah, and there's like all these like Jewish luminaries who like have said wildly uncomfortable things. And I, and I guess yeah. So and I guess one of the things that you the points that I sort of would imagine and you know, clarify if I'm wrong is you know that especially. As Jews, we need to be careful about endorsing th bits with the ways of talking about ethnicity yeah. that reinforce stereotypes that can that help sort of re reify racial categories dangerously. Yeah. Is that kind of yeah, 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 exactly. 
Yeah, and so I think, you know, it, it's what, what you want to do when you think about it. I, I mean, it's a great topic for, for writing about. Um, uh, what you want to do is you want to think, well, what are, what are the examples, right? You don't necessarily have to, as I say, you, not an archive you can go to, but you've seen this in yeah. lots of places. You've seen examples, and you have, as you've seen these things, you have sort of noticed a common thread. And you've noticed that thread, and you want to point out that there seems to be this kind of thing happening, this tendency among some people in your community. And so you want to come up with, you know, what are the examples? List every way that you can think of that this occurs. Every time you've seen it, you know, take, take quotes from Pinker's writings. And one of the things I always advise is, is use quotes. Use people's quotes against them because uh, <laughs> if you just characterize something, um, if, you just, if you just describe something, then you're putting your spin on it. But if you can just quote what people are saying directly, um, then they are building your case for you. And you, your, your commentary is on top of the case that you have built just by organizing things that other people have said. Things that, so take what Pinker says, take what Stevens, uh, Stevens says, um, take every example you can think of. Talk to other people that you think may, may have shared your observation and seen similar things happening. Ask them the examples. And the key to making your case is going to be examples. Is going to be, look, no, showing people how to see the common thread that you've seen by putting the examples together, organizing it, and going, look, it's clearly here. And I think if you do that, you can produce a really phenomenally persuasive uh, piece of writing. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Nesreen, did you? Here, I'll, wait, wait. The fun thing about this is you can toss it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> So in short, my project is about um, students working on issues that they care about, and mm -hmm. then it all leads up to a student lobby day in um, like in a couple months. Mm -hmm. So c two kind of questions in one. Um, when we go lobby in Lansing, the likelihood of elected officials actually caring about the issues that we're talking about without any sort of media coverage or anything mm -hmm. beforehand is very unlikely, just given sure. that they don't care what a bunch right. of students coming in to think. So one of the issues that we're talking about is education funding and then the discrepancy between education funding and prison funding. Mm -hmm. And I know this has been an issue that's been kind of talked about in the past, but for example, in the state of Michigan, prison funding right now has more funding than higher education overall. And that's the one thing is like, Jeez. if that doesn't make people angry, but I was just curious as to- Make me angry. If you- <laughs> I, think, oh, oh, I, think I think it does, you know, yeah. it can make people angry, so yeah. So just one thing is that if you have any tips on yeah. how to do that, and then also afterward, when we go to Lansing, if we don't get the feedback from the elected officials that we want, how to hold them accountable with like local newspapers, but without yeah. being completely like partisan and like all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So what was your name, sorry? Nisreen. Nisreen. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think. You, you're absolutely right to be a little bit cynical and to say that, you know, if you just go and present an issue to a legislator, um, why it's politics, if they don't have an incentive to do something, if they're not under political pressure, if they don't have public opinion against them, you know, they will listen to you, thank you for your time, and nothing will happen. So you have to build up um, not just public awareness, because I think there is a large scale there is kind of an awareness that the prison system has gotten out of control. But you have to build up what I'd say is first a, a, a real serious public demand and then a, an actual form of action. Because one of the things about politics and, and, and legislators is you need to give them the thing you want them to do specifically. And if you give them the thing, if you have the piece of legislation, if you have the, uh, if the piece of legislation, I don't know, hypothetically, if the piece of legislation is um, the prison system can never have higher funding than the education system in Michigan, right? Just hypothetically, like the, those things can never be, uh, or, you know, higher education funding always has to be twice the amount of the, the you know, prison system. That's a piece of legislation. That's a, and then you, you, you know, you frame it. You go like, this is our, are two to one bill, and it's always two to one education versus versus prisons. 
Um, that something that sticks in the mind. People went, yeah, and then and that draws people's attention to the ridiculous uh, ratio that's gotten out of control. So I'd say, you know, there are ways to, um, you know, drawing attention to it is a matter of framing it in a really really compelling way that gets all these people who have this kind of mild understanding of it to really have a serious understanding of it. It's pretty easy. I think you should try and get. Uh, an op-ed in, you know, one of the, you know, local papers have been disappearing, but it'd be very useful to get something, uh, to get some media coverage in advance of going, to have, you know, this is, uh, to draw attention to the exact numbers, the exact local situation, to get quotes from people in the education system who are, talk who are dealing with uh, underfunding. Um, and what it's actually, what the realities are actually like uh, to to deal with it, uh, uh, to deal with underfunding, and um, and then and then put together something, send it out, get someone to uh, reprint it, even if you're even if it's a small publication, because one of the things is yeah, legislators don't respond that well to just people going into their offices, you know they do a little bit, but um, it doesn't take that much political pressure to convince them that there is a serious issue there. It doesn't take that much writing to make something a thing, um, to make something uh, the thing that people are discussing. So you want to think, how do we make this the thing that people are discussing? And then how do we frame it in ways that are compelling? Hopefully, how do we promulgate some kind of desired solution to it so that then we can push them, push them, push them for that solution and shame them if they don't endorse the solution, say, look, we are looking for you to sign on to a commitment that funding will never, uh, you know, the funding ratio will never go beyond this. Um, and we want that commitment. Then you go, look, X, X number of legislatures won't sign the funding commitment. And, uh, you know, write an op-ed about well, the importance of the funding commitment. You know, that, that sort of thing. So what was your second, the second part of your question? Um, I think you answered both. Of oh, good. One of Fantastic. Them was, yeah, because one of them was about, like, the issue would solve, and then the other one was more of just, like, general legislative. Okay. Stuff. So you answered both. Oh, questions. good. Well, I've done one. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I just had a general question. Sure. Um, so this is about like when you were starting. So there are lots of left-wing outlets, right? Yes. Um, so when you were doing your Kickstarter, how did you differentiate differentiate yourself from the others, and how did you kind of raise the funding in order to start the organic growth? Yeah. That you've actually. So I yet? said, <laughs> thanks. Sorry, what was your name? Nate. Nate. Also Nate. My name. Yes. Uh, it's a good name. <laughs> uh, I. Uh, so the way I differentiated it is I said, well, unlike other political publications, we're going to be fun. Uh, you're actually going to enjoy reading it. Because one of the things I noticed, so I looked at, I asked myself the question, you know, there are a lot of left-wing outlets. Why, why, why do you think there ought to be another? Am I, do I just feel so, do I feel so self-important that I feel that my, I am, you know, I just need to, I just need to be heard? And I thought, no, I mean, yes, partially, but also, like, I was thinking, there are a lot of left-wing outlets, but I realized I don't read that many left-wing outlets. And I asked myself, why? I'm, I'm on the political left. I should. I should be the target audience for, for these things. Why don't I read these things? And I, I thought to myself, well, one reason I don't read uh, many left-wing outlets is because they depress me. And they seem like a catalog of miseries with the world. And that's a problem with the left, is that being a political leftist often involves looking at, no, I think that's, that's a crucial part of it, you know, looking, being a bearing witness to human suffering and, and caring about other people's difficult lives. But at the same time, if you just depress people, they're not going to want to necessarily read your publication. Um, and I thought, well, is there a way to combine both? Is there a way to not sacrifice the depth of moral outrage at serious, terrible things in the world, but also to say, we're still capable of joy. We still want people to have fun. And so the thing that we promised in our Kickstarter is we said, you know, this is going to be an outlet that does serious political analysis and combines it with frivolity and delight. 
And so if you look at our publications, we have tons of, of fun original illustrations. We have comics in here. We have little games and puzzles. We have, uh, you know, we have just fun stuff that we, that we so like the table of contents here is, a, is an I spy. So I made, I put like all these different objects and there's an object correlated to each article and you have to find the object that represents each article in the issue. Um, because that's fun. Um, you know, uh, I have, I've been making these interesting, these cool tables of contents. Um, this table of contents is, is little framed pictures on a mantelpiece. And I, I did pictures of, uh, this, this table of contents is, um, this one's, um, Patches. It's, it's little patches, uh, you, you iron on patches. I found a patch to represent each article. It's just fun. You know, I mean, it's just a way of, you're not sacrificing the, the, the you're not saying the world is any less sad, but you're also saying like, uh, you know, it's important to give people comfort and joy. And so that's what we kind of put in the pitch. And that's, I think, what keeps a lot of people coming to us and what they say is, is distinctive about our outlet. But, but in order to give you a general piece of advice that goes beyond our particular magazine, I would say, ask yourself that same question. What is the thing that I am adding? Why do I want to do this thing? What is the thing that I think is missing? Um, and then that, that really gives you your answer for how you're supposed to show people. You go, look, this thing is missing. This is the whole reason I want to do it is because I think this is the thing that's missing. Uh, and then you can sell people on that. Whoa. OK. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so very Catalina. Catalina. I, I was relating to what Nashreen was saying about um, education and prison funding. And, yeah. Um, I think understanding underlying causes to that being that you can get students to finance their own education through student loans. And that brings on a whole other crisis that you can't mm -hmm. get prisoners to fund their own yeah. prison bed by giving them a loan, right? Yeah. So, I, I, no, I just say this because that's the issue I'm passionate about is sure. from like the student perspective. There's nobody truly advocating for the student in the whole student loan equation. Mm -hmm. There's like policymakers, there's a lot of companies that want to do refinancing, right. and there's just a lot of moving parts and nobody that's including the university, not truly advocating for the student because Absolutely. their interest is in getting you enrolled, even if it's not in your best interest to be enrolled at this particular institution. So mm -hmm. I'm at a place where um, I'm really interested in raising awareness. Yeah. Um, I've written policy-based type articles for my local paper at home. Yeah. But the audience I want to touch are, are students as well as parents who are helping their children make really life-altering choices at a very young age. Sure. And so I'm not quite sure because there's a part of me that thinks like a YouTube channel would be more appropriate. <laughs> there's a part of me that thinks... I don't know. I'm just trying to think yeah. about how to get more information sure. out in a way that's accessible to my. No, you're. Community. I mean, you're completely right that nobody, uh, the students don't really have an advocate in the in the horrendously broken financing system. And you, you know, when you look at charts of types of debt over time in the country, you know, housing debt is like this. You know, credit card debt is like this, and total student debt is like this. Um, you know, it's, it's just gotten to absurd proportions. And one of the scary things is that now it's kind of accepted as normal. Right. The, the, the idea that you're going to have to be working most of the rest of your life to pay off your education is almost accepted as just that's a thing that happens. Um, and that's, that's a problem. People think that if people can't imagine a different world, right? And, and so one of the things that you, you're going to face kind of two, you're going to face a couple challenges. One challenge that you're going to face is not necessarily getting students to care, because they all care about their financial situation because they're all suffering, right. um, but getting people to spend time thinking about this issue, is that's kind of a different thing. You know, you put up a YouTube channel, you've got to get people to watch it. And how do you make an issue that is in many ways complicated in that it involves thinking about finance. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you make people, right? How do you produce something that people watch and feel? And then, and then you've got to take, how do I take sentiments of outrage and how do I turn those into a concrete demand? 
And that second thing that I think you're thinking about is like, how do I get people to imagine a better system? What would it look like? Mm -hmm. How do I get, what am I, what am I, and if you can do that, I mean, I find that it's a really key thing to do is getting people to think. Um, and I, I think this is one reason that like uh, single payer healthcare has like totally, the, the discourse around it has totally changed over the last, last couple of years is because the advocates for it have succeeded in getting people to think, yeah, I can imagine a world where we just go to the doctor and it doesn't, and we don't get a gigantic bill afterwards. And so if you come up with ways to say, look, you, if, if students band together as a group, if they have, if they sort of, you know, not unionize, but if students sort of recognize their collective interest here, and if they have a vision for a different kind of way to finance the, uh, university education, and if they have a collective sense that that, that thing is attainable, then you can, you can really push forward. And people, I find, what I find is that people don't like thinking about issues that make them feel hopeless. It's really tough to get people to read about stuff if they read about it and they just feel crushed and they go, I can't, we can't, what do we do about it? So I think your job is to answer the question to people, here's what we're gonna do about it, here's what you're facing, and here's a different thing, and if you join me, we're gonna, we're gonna fix this. And if you give the people the sense, we're gonna fix this, they really will, I think you really will find that they're actually eager to watch your videos, to read, read your pieces. Yeah, because I do you're have actionable be, things. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good yeah. feedback, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name's um, Catherine. I should say straight Hello, off, I'm, um, I'm a journalist from the UK. I'm here on a Knight Wallace Fellowship. Um, I'm actually here examining the underrepresentation of people lower down the socio-economic scale. Um, the people who are employed as journalists, the stories mm. we're telling, how we're telling them. And I wonder what you think the mainstream media needs to do to reconnect with these audiences who might have ideas that make us the woolly liberal media feel uncomfortable. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I mean, it's true, uh, yeah, it's true everywhere, but in, in Britain it has historically been true, right, that journalists are, you know, the number of people who are from a uh, lower socioeconomic background who make it in, in journalism is, is, is very, very small. Uh, uh, when I started out 30 years ago on a local newspaper, most of the people there weren't graduates. Hmm. Now you can't, very get, rare. now you can't get a foot in the door unless yeah. you've got a degree. I mean, well, it's very difficult for me to come up with a, a I mean... I just wonder if we left it too late. Do you think you, it's too late? You have far more experience in journalism than I even do, so I really feel like I'm not the one... Uh, I feel like this, is, this situation should be reversed. The reason, but, the reason I ask it is because one of the first things you said was your frustration with the mainstream media, yeah. the constraints upon the sort yeah. of things you wanted to write. So right. I just wondered... What were those constraints? Oh, well, I can tell you that, which is that I did feel like all of the, th the pieces of writing that I was the most proud of were the pieces of writing that were least likely to get published, which was very strange to me. I was publishing things that I felt were uh, what we call hot takes, where you're just, where the, the increasingly uh, news organizations are cutting their reporting staff or relying on hot takes, where you just have a really strong opinion about the news and you're like, I'm mad about this thing. And I, I'm mad about a lot of things, so I don't mind doing that kind of writing. But I also felt like I, so for example, with, um, with Robert's story, I, I mean, I'm glad we got the op-ed in, but the op-ed was not something that I was especially proud of, because it was literally just, let's present the facts, get it to an audience. The piece of writing that I was really proud of was the one where I dived into his autobiography. It was really interesting because it told, I really, I stepped back in that piece and I let him tell his story because I had this autobiography. And so, you know, the, I, I've, got the, I, I've got the essay in this, uh, in this book, Interesting Times, if you want to read it. But the essay is really mostly not me. It's mostly told by Robert. I went through his book and I took extracts and I weaved them together with some narration on my part. But 
it was a piece in which I, uh, you know, Robert's autobiography is very sprawling. It's 160,000 words. I mean, it's far too long. Uh, you know, it, it needs it needs cutting. It needs cutting down. It needs a lot of editing. He's a very unpolished writer. Uh, but I help polish it up, and I help put together his his story. A guy whose story isn't told, and 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 I try to find a way to present it that people would be compelled by this autobiography that without my presentation they wouldn't necessarily read because it's 160,000 words and it's sitting you know uh, un, uncopy edited on a website so that that was the but I couldn't it would be very hard for me to get that published anywhere else because people would go well this isn't your piece of writing you've just woven together it's a it's an odd piece of writing actually because like it's a paragraph from me a paragraph from Robert paragraph from me paragraph from Robert and um, that was a kind of piece where I felt I really, you know, want to give voice to someone who's not in the media, but I, I can't do it um, if I'm going to other outlets. And so the, one of the answers is, as I say, I really think crowdfunding is amazing. Oh, uh, Max Alvarez, who is here, who is my dear, dear friend, I want to plug his, Max has a fantastic, he's, he's really my answer to this because he has a fantastic podcast that everyone should listen to and it's called Working People. And what Max does, is he goes and he finds people who are just ordinary, everyday, working people. And he just chats to them about their lives, about their struggles, their aspirations, their frustrations. Um, he talked to, he's most recently done a series on the GM workers who were laid off uh, at Lordstown. You know, the news stories about those workers, yeah, they include a little clip of someone saying, oh, the community's devastated. But, you know, Max really tried to get at and get out of them what it was like for them, what they felt like, the feelings that they had at that moment. And, and what he tries to do with this podcast is just give them, just turn the mic over. And his job is to curate and to edit and to present, but he really turns the mic over. And it's a, you know, it's a crowdfunded podcast. And it's hard to get that, so you don't see that thing in the mainstream media institutions, but he's building an alternative media institution. And I think that's a really cool example of the way that you can give voice to people who don't uh, have their voices heard. Hi, so I'm uh, Noah. I'm, uh, I'm actually a high school English teacher, uh, which I feel like is good preparation for going into writing. Mm -hmm. Not because I know the English language, but because I'm used to putting out things I love to be met with general indifference. Um, but um, <laughs> so uh, probably one of my one of my biggest uh, sort of like areas where I'm uncomfortable with other people on the left and you know yeah. so to give a sense of like my views my favorite writers include like Glenn Greenwald and Noam Chomsky and you know Albert Camus uh, so uh, is you know the idea of human nature I think that people uh, contrary to a lot of people who follow Marx I think that there is a human nature um, even if we don't we can't say exactly what it is right now and and um, the this kind of like view uh, that human beings are just, you know, uh, kind of uh, not, uh, that, that there's nothing essential that is kind of common to all people is something that I feel kind of takes uh, the soul, not in a metaphysical sense, but sure. the, the, the warm feeling out of a lot of writing. Sure. Um, and so to me, one of the ways to put that back is to kind of, uh, is to, is uh, through art. I feel that artists like Camus, uh, who's you know my favorite writer, uh, really find a way to uh, kind of reach that uh, human essential core, um, and that actually what you find when you do that is that art and politics are very because politics is like just ethics on a bigger scale. Yeah. Art and ethics are very close, and art and politics are very close. So sure. I guess what I'm interested in writing about is like how those two things are together uh, and, and why, you know, the arts mm -hmm. should be, you know, especially arts that really are about affirming human dignity should mm -hmm. really be the center of any, like, humane political sure. uh, movement. And, um, yeah, that, but that is kind of, it feels... Like, it feels very practical to me when I'm thinking about it because mm -hmm. it's, like, the thing that's most important to me. Sure. But then when I talk about it, 
with people, I get kind of like, "Uh uh-huh, like, yeah, that's kind of abstract, you know? I mean, like, it seems very remote from life, even though, to me, it's all actually really, it's about getting more in touch with life in a concrete way, so. Well, but. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And uh, good taste in writers, too. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, what I say here is, look, if you feel like you're telling people something and they're not getting why you feel that it's important, what I try and do at that point is go, okay, what is, what, how can I get this person to see where I'm coming from? This is why, where the kind of imagining the reader thing come in. It's like this, this very difficult empathy exercise of, you know, and it's kind of part of your politics is, is mm-hmm. thinking about how other people think and thinking mm-hmm. about how, you know, how do people reason what interests people? Um, if, we, if you do believe the thing you're saying, that you know, there, is, there, is, there are these common bonds, we should be able to have these, uh, you should be able to express it in ways people will understand and appreciate because it's common, these things are, 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 are common and they will understand. So the question is, how do you express these thoughts that you have in ways that people, instead of just going, uh-huh, uh-huh, will go, <laughs> yes, you are so right. And so then what do you do? Well, one thing is that you try not to make it abstract. You try to give people real examples of of what you mean. You rework your sentences until you feel this sentence is a perfect expression of the thing that I am absolutely trying to say. And that's that's a thing that you absolutely see in like, uh, you know, Camus essays, for example, you know, you really see um, the, the guy whose whose words are so precise and clear, and 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 w- that, that it makes you go, yes, yes, absolutely, that is what that, you know, that I I, I, I can see what, what the, the struggle of Sisyphus on the uh, you know rolling the ball, I can see that the feeling that he had when it, you know his it, the, the striking thing to me is his uh, article on the death penalty where mm-hmm. you know his father comes back from watching an execution mm-hmm. and uh, you know that that there's one of the most powerful essays on the death penalty. Why? Why is that powerful? What gives that piece of writing its power? And so you need to sit and think, you know, what, what is it that awakens in other people um, this, uh, this understanding of, of what I'm trying uh, to say? And I think, you know, one thing is going to be like, how can I make myself really, really clear? You know, because one reason that people on the left, uh, I, I think you're right that many of them react instinctively negatively to discussions of, of human nature and one of the there's a good reason for that I mean I, I, I very I'm very sympathetic with that. I mean I think it's almost the right reaction to have because it is something that is kind of almost associated with like Charles Murray or like people or you know and and then Stephen Pinker for example uses the is critical of the the blank slate but is also critical in a way that is not sympathetic to the humane left and so you need you're going to need to find ways to distinguish yourself and say this is what i'm not saying this is what i am saying this is what i think you really need to understand and this is what i would distance myself from and really get precise and really just hone your words and hone your words until everyone who reads it goes absolutely and i think i, th- I think you can do it. i think you've got important thoughts to express and i have no no doubt that as, a, as an english teacher you produce an incredible piece on this Uh, hi, so, my, are you, okay, I don't want to, yeah, sorry, so my name, name? my name is Alex, hello Alex, um, I go down, I go to university down the street at Eastern Michigan University, cool. um, and I kind of think that school is at the forefront of the neoliberalization of higher education, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> we're kind of, which just, I assume you're opposed to, yeah, I'm opposed yeah. to, no, I love it, it's great, <laughs> <laughs> I love these um, <laughs> But um, I think I think we're kind of at the forefront of it. I know other universities have sold like one thing or two things, but we're sure. we've sold two things and we're about to sell like two or three more things. Wow. Um, and it's Jeez. all very secretive and it's all very like administrations like, well, we yeah. care about what you say. No, we don't. We're doing yeah. it anyways. Fill out the survey. And so <laughs> kind of like 
I, and I want to write about that and why, about mm -hmm. why it's important. But my fear is that it's a very local issue. Like, I feel people here, in, I'm only 10 miles away from Ann Arbor, and I feel like people here in Ann Arbor don't even care about it. Um, and I have, like, I, I have ideas, because I've spent a lot of time writing in undergrad and high school, so yeah. I have ideas about how to make the hook and how to, yeah. like, get people yeah. to care when they're reading. But do you kind of have any tips about how to get people to care about, like, what seems like local yeah. issues but are kind of yeah. more national issues? Yeah, right, because it's not a local issue, right? You're talking about the, you're, you're at the forefront of a national trend. And so it isn't, it isn't provincially, it's not the things, the things that are going on at East uh, Michigan University are a case study in a wider trend. So you know that what you want to do is you want to not make it about your particular, you, you want to produce a piece of writing that you don't have to know anything about your university to, to read and enjoy, that you don't have to, I mean one of the things that I, I would say is, is in writing is presume that your reader knows nothing about the topic, doesn't care about the topic. In fact, presume they're actively uninterested in the topic. I mean, they really are just, they couldn't care less and you are trying to, because when I edit a magazine, we have to have 10 different uh, uh, articles in an issue. They're all gonna be on different things. But when people read an, uh, the issue, I want them to read every article, even though they're not gonna care about eight of the 10 topics. So. One of the things that you, 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 wanna, you wanna really link your example, so you really wanna make your examples vivid. You wanna talk about the specific things, the specific things that have been sold, you know, the, the process. Take people in, tell the story, you know, build them just a compelling story of what's going on at the university. Constantly tie it back to these national trends. Don't just incorporate examples from your university. University of Akron just like closed the history department to fund the, you know, the, the, like the, there are all these places that are like increasing sports and business majors and getting rid of uh, the humanities and, um, and social sciences. Um, you know. Uh, esports, the esports. They're building the esports complex, uh, but getting rid of the history major, um, and uh, you know that's 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 devastating. Um, but uh, yeah. So and then uh, the other thing is, like, neoliberalization is a word that I try and avoid the hell out of whenever I can because I write for my parents, and my parents don't like they're not leftists they don't ha my parents don't have college degrees they are literate people who are interested in reading a good piece of writing but they all they see the word neoliberalization I, I what so you know not what but like you know it's not this is not a compelling word so find ways to write i say write just compelling sentence by sentence level just write compelling prose just if you can write really satisfying prose, really crisp language, really beautiful descriptors, you can write, you know, you can write in ways where just the reading of the writing itself is satisfying, you can get people to read about almost anything. And so focus on the craft of your writing and producing just a really clear, well-written, beautiful piece of writing that really captures the phenomenon you're talking about, and I'm certain that you, you can get people to pay attention to something even if they have never been, never set foot in Eastern Michigan. On that note, you should also read Max's essay called Can the Working Class Speak? Can, yeah. It's an amazing example of that. So, yes, Max wrote <laughs> a, uh, you know, not just, not, he does not just host the podcast, but he also has a fantastic article in uh, this issue of Current Affairs. Uh, which is called Can the Working Class Speak? And, and uh, there's a lot of beautiful material about uh, his father's life and about starting the podcast, so read it in current affairs. And with that, Max, going to be the last question. Oh. We've got about five minutes, so turn it over to you. I've also written a shit ton about the neoliberalization of higher ed, yeah. so we should talk. Um, now, you better not ask me a tough question because I plugged you so much. I won't. <laughs> it's got to be a friendly. Hey, the rock, don't listen to anything this guy says. Um, thank you. Uh, first time, long time. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've absolutely loved everything that you've said. And I think that, um, you know, even for, even for me, you know, like uh, who's been in the lefty writing world, now podcasting world for a few years now, mm -hmm. it's very easy to get despondent and, mm -hmm. and to feel isolated and to feel like you are lacking that sense of fire and purpose that got you into it in the first place. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, you said something in the podcast a um, couple episodes back where you compared it to Seinfeld. And you said that it, it has to be a place that you want to be. Oh, yeah. And I thought that was a great way to put it because that actually, <laughs> well, I think, is what a lot of us get from you and from yeah. current affairs. It's, Just, it's a vision of a leftist politics. It's a vision of being social. It's a culture that you want to be a part of that doesn't yeah. make you feel hopeless, that makes you feel like you're part of something positive and around people who support what you're doing. And, and I guess I wanted to ask, kind of in closing, like what your advice would be to people who want to get involved in writing, mm -hmm. podcasting, any sort of, you know, the stuff that you were talking about here, um, while not letting the realities of our media sphere beat them into yeah. cynicism and all the kind of tribalistic bullshit that we see on the left, but it's, it's everywhere, right? Sure. Because you get into it, like you, like you were saying, you email editors, you email writers who you love, you get connections that way, but then you get something published, people don't share it, yeah. or someone says something that you've said in an article and you're like, hey, why didn't you hyperlink to me, right? You start taking everything very yeah. personally. Yeah. You start getting caught up in yeah. like the obsequious bullshit of like <laughs> jerking off Doug Henwood on Facebook just so sure. he'll notice you, right? I mean like, and, and that's, that's the wrong reason sure. to get involved in all of this, the wrong reason to stay yeah. in it. And it makes for bad writing. Yeah. Too. This is something you and I have talked about a lot, right? Yeah. There, there are many lefty writers we could point to who were like, well, their main objective is to like, you know, corral their following and, and you sure. know, like seem cool. Yeah. So well, you are a paragon of like how to not buy into that crap as much I as possible. I still want to seem cool. You are. Well, uh, I think I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I mean, I, I know to, by the I purple jacket. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, so how do you do it? I mean, like, how do you, I guess, keep... Yeah. The, the, the right yeah. stuff in mind, how do you, how do you, what would your yeah. advice be to people to not get sucked well, into that? First, I just want to, you know, uh, expand on the, 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 the thing that you mentioned about the Seinfeld. What it is is that Jerry Seinfeld has a quote where he says something like, one of the reasons that Seinfeld was such a successful show was not the quality of the, the jokes or the characters or even, it was almost like the, the place, which is an odd thing to say. And he says something like it's the, it's the you know, the, 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 the the set, it's almost like it's, it's Jerry's apartment. It's these people in this place. And I just want to be in this place with these people. And he said, he's, he almost said it's about a place. Good television is always about a place. And that's why, you know, it, 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 a lot of sitcoms are so successful because they create a place that you want to be, that you want to go to. Uh, you know, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is a, it's a, it's a house that you want to be in with this guy. And so, you know, you have to create that kind of with your writing. You have to create the place that people want to go, people want to be around you and this, you know, but this wimp, I, I want, you know, I want a cup of tea and a copy of Current Affairs and I want to go to the, the world of, of this magazine. But on, on the actual question that you asked, uh, you know, one of the, so I mean, I can say the, the banal and obvious thing, which is just focus on producing your work and forget everything else and just focus on, um, you know, but you have to, as you say, you operate within a landscape where if you want to make a living, you have to get the thing published, which means you're going, you can't just completely ignore the constraints. Op-eds are really unfortunate because they've all got to be 700 words. They follow a real, a real for, they're really formulaic. Um, so to the extent possible, just ignore I, but what I what I always what I kind of like to think of is I have this concept where I have like um, it's a little silly, but I have um, in my in my head I have what I call my my personal board of directors, <laughs> and my personal board of directors is all of the people that I respect and that I think are like my personal. Like I'm executing the vision that I'm, and I go and I consult with, because, and books are wonderful for this, because if you hate, if the world around you is full of people who don't know what they're talking about, you can go to your world of books and you can consult with all the great minds of the ages and you can ask them what they thought and they'll tell you and they'll offer you guidance. And so have them as your guidepost. Imagine, so in my personal board of directors, I have everyone from, you know, like Eugene Debs and Martin Luther King and, you know, Emma Goldman to the, the friends that I respect, you know, 
about the people like Max and Jeff, the people, you know, the people whose opinions I actually really respect. And then, so I don't think, you can't ignore everyone else. You, you don't, you don't want to get to the point, because this is what leads you to narcissism and overconfidence, is if you just go, I only care about my writing, I don't listen to the anybody else, I don't care about the critics. You should care about the critics, but you should care about the critics you care about. You should care about the people whose judgment you value and respect. So when I write an article, like, I don't care if the comment sections are full of a hundred people calling me a moron, because they will always be. Um, did that just happen in the last day to you? It did just happen in the last day, man. <laughs> you know, but, but, but I do care if the people that, whose opinions I respect go, that was a really ill thought out article. And so I think about, I consult with, you know, first, the, you know, the living and the dead, your, 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 your panel of people who's, who you want to really, um, who you want to make proud, really, who, who, whose values you respect, whose opinions you respect. Think about those people, write for those people. So I write for my parents, I write for my friends, I write for the fellow editors that I've gathered at Current Affairs, I've gathered a group of the writers I most respect, the editors I most respect, the people I actually like and trust. And then, once you, once you, just, once you defer to those people, you talk to those people, then everyone else can go, you know, just, so ignore the people that, that, whose judgment you don't care about, and, but, 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 but the counterpoint is pay a lot of attention to the people who you really think have your best interests at heart and, and who want you, want you to do well and uh, who you think make the world a better place. Um, so that's how I'd answer that. All right. Well, thank well, you so much, Nathan. Thanks very much for having me. Obviously, subscribe to Current Affairs, buy our books and products. <laughs> Currentaffairs.org, highly recommended. Or just go down to the Optimize office, we have them all there. But mm -hmm. after you read it, then you should subscribe. Subscribe. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be hanging around for a few minutes here. So if you have more yeah. questions, come on up come and chat up. with Nathan. So, yeah, thanks so much. Mm -hmm.